Good day, everyone. Welcome to IDRC's Leader in Action series. I'm Jean Lebel. I'm the president of the International Development Research Center here in Ottawa. And today, joining me is Dr. Agnès Calibata, who is the president of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, an organization she has been heading since last year. But before we get into this, let's talk a little bit with Agnès and get to know her better. Agnès, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you have been having a career that is quite remarkable as a researcher at the, uh, institu uh, the International Institute on Tropical Agriculture, as a policy actor in the government of Rwanda that brought you up to the ministry, being, having been the Minister of Agriculture for many years. But at the root, you're a young African girl and you decide to do your research on bugs as an entomologist. Give me the connection between all this career path and where you are today. Thank you. Um, there are two things growing up. There are, uh, there are few things you could do. You, you, the dream as a young girl was either you become a medical doctor, uh, agriculture was big because all our parents were doing agriculture. That's all you saw around you, or a teacher. So if you didn't make it to medical school, then the other thing was to go to agriculture. So I went for agriculture. But also, the, the idea of trying to be in a place where you can find a job that makes, has a meaning to other people around you is really what got me into agriculture. And, and particularly entomology was from the perspective of um, the fact that pests are a major issue for agriculture and crop protection is one of the areas I wanted to address as a person growing up in, a, in a, an environment of farming where I saw my parents lose crops year in, year out. If they are not losing crops at production, they are losing crops at harvest. So I thought that if I was going to be in agriculture, the best place to be was to be in a position where you can prevent some of those losses. That's quite interesting because, yeah. you know, studying the very small organism, insects, didn't prevent you of thinking quite big because you became Minister of Agriculture. What was your fingerprint in Rwanda? Because Rwanda is becoming one of this nation in Africa that has come from very difficult time and now has been on the growth path for a year. I was reading a recent report that the tourism industry seems to be growing to level even higher than prior to the sad events that we know. So what have been your input into the Ministry of Agriculture, and what is your best accomplishment there? Um, um, the Rwanda's, Rwanda's agricultural sector um, is really a huge part of Rwanda's economy today. Um, a huge population, part of the population, 75% of the population is in agriculture in Rwanda. So that is a part that you couldn't neglect. So my biggest contribution was to turn this into some part of, of Rwanda's economy from a food insecure uh, part of the, of, the, of the country where you, you, you actually see farmers, when I came in, farmers couldn't feed themselves. So my job was working with the government to help government design policies that would not only create food security but would also allow agriculture to become part of the national economy. Today, agriculture contributes um, about 31% to the GDP of the country and has been growing stably um, at about 5%. Now, that's huge. That's huge given that um, only around 2006 we were not feeding ourselves. 70% so. of the country wasn't feeding itself. Now we are part, the country is actually having surplus. And this prepared you quite well for leading AGRA, the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa, uh, a partnership of many partners that provide core support, IDRC is one of them, a partnership with also the leadership of Africa in numbers of country, but a leadership in the organization itself, because it's an organization that is led by African for Africa in order to feed Africa, and in a very integrated manner, mm -hmm. from seed to soil, to market, to policy, to organization, to people, to financing. Uh, it's quite an integrated package of things you're looking at. You've been taking the presidency last year. Uh, 
What do you see as having been the one or two biggest win of AGRA in the last 10 years since they have been created? Um, one of the things that I like very much about AGRA and that I wanted to identify with coming from my previous job as a Minister of Agriculture was the fact that the, weak, the biggest weakness Africa has is lack of institutions, local institutions delivering on simple things as seeds to, to, to farmers, as uh, fertilizers to farmers. The, the, the lack, the pure sheer lack of private sector, but also the lack of technologies and technological innovations was, is, is huge. So AGRA does address those, but also works on creating solutions and institutions in the farming environment. AGRA goes a step further and, and works on building national institutions so that they can continue fueling what's happening at the, at the smallholder farmer. So these are the things that got me excited when I see the fact that by building these institutions around the farm, farmer's environment, around the private sector environment, but also at national level, Agra is building capacities for these countries to stand on their own to build food security. I think that is Agra's biggest success. And you know, a clear example of this is, are the seeds company that have been created with the support of Agra. You were mentioning to me yeah. earlier, there's about 90s of them, 90 of them in Africa. This is private business that is providing quality seed for having quality crop and highest, you know, return. But what are, what do you see as the biggest challenge, you know, uh, for Agra in the future? Yeah, so Agra has generated these elements, these seed companies are in place, fertilizer companies are beginning to be in place, farmers are beginning to produce to sc at a scale, but there's still a challenge of market and market linkages functioning okay. There's still a challenge of having the right policies to drive markets, to drive trade, to drive harmonization because uh, again countries exist in geographies where harmonization is needed. So. The, 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 there's also still a challenge of finance to sustain yeah. the momentum of what has been started. So for me, the three key things on, on the upstreams, on the other side is markets, markets, policies, and, 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 and finance. If these things can start functioning, then farmers are beginning to get the feel of what, what production is about and how to produce more than more than they need so that they can have surpluses. Farmers are beginning to, to get excited about having excess yields that they can turn into incomes. They're beginning to look at farming as a business. Private sector is beginning to become interested in agriculture as a business as opposed to agriculture as a forgotten area. Youth are beginning to look at this as a possible area they can start contributing, sell things to farmers, be, create services around farmers. And this is a huge opportunity for the continent. A continent that is on the growth, you know, the percentage of GNE that has been going up over the years is maintained in Africa. And you are bringing a very interesting point. I think in development world, uh, agriculture has been seen for many, many years as a tool, you know, to get out of poverty and to, you know, have subsistence. But really the paradigm is shifting, as you're saying, because agriculture is business. And these farmer wants to make money out of it. And what you are contributing is to help them, you know, with the story that we have been telling about seeds companies and there's others. Now, youth, let's conclude uh, uh, on youth. Um, how can you attract a teenager, 15, 20 years old, male or female, to do agriculture? When they have an iPhone or, you know, a Samsung, you know, S something, they see the world and we are offering them to go to the field in hardship to cultivate and, you know, with very limited resources. How do we make this attractive to youth in Africa? A number of ways, but let me just say that even besides youth, even for farmers, for agriculture to be attractive, it has to be a business. It has to make sense. It has to be profitable. Uh, right now, I mean, f f up to now, it hasn't been that attractive in terms of business sense. So we need to create uh, a narrative around agriculture being a business. So that, that one we already said. So, but there are a number of things we can do. There are opportunities we can exploit around agricultural mechanization in terms of 
uh, reducing the cost of doing business, the labor intensity that is needed at production, reducing the losses that happen, building solutions, innovations around post-harvest management. We are beginning to see these, building services around mechanization. We are beginning to see this attract more youth, you know, get, get them more interested. And these are not huge solutions. Then These are not, I'm not talking about youth owning tractors, about owning huge machines. I'm talking about youth being part of a, a service, you know, being part of a, a solution, being employed by someone who owns those machines, being, uh, having an opportunity to buy a small equipment that can shell maize for farmers so that they create jobs, so that they go around villages providing solutions. But also there's the telephone system that is now coming up and providing more opportunities. Uh, 500, it is said that 500 million Africans by 2020 will own telephones. This is, it's beginning, it's a place where we are beginning to see a lot of movement in terms of getting financial solutions to farmers. Getting cash transfer of, by cash farmers. Transfers, getting all sorts of solutions to farmers. Youth are beginning to create jobs just around that, you know, um, just charging telephones. But how do we then take that uh, availability of the telephone? and turn it into solutions for farmers in terms of plant clinics, in terms of giving s youth knowledge that they can go selling to farmers or providing solutions to farmers, providing those kind of, of jobs around farming that make, make it easy for youth to stay in villages. African governments are also beginning to invest in availability of internet in these villages. It's, it's, as as the, the telephone service goes, the private sector is also investing in the internet and the youth Believe you me, in villages that don't have roads are connecting to people in 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 Western world, are looking at markets for tomatoes, are looking for, at markets for vegetables, and these are ways we can, you know, bringing knowledge to youth, giving them the right skills where they are, but also giving them the right um, instruments that they need to start being part of creating solutions in the environment, is going to be key, and we need to be looking at what are those innovations going to be and financing them so that youth can find a reason. Remember, Africa, 75% of African population is, is tending to youth. So That's a huge yes. part of the population. Yeah. So if we are going to deal with it, with, with, to deal with that growing population, we have to create an interest around something that is available to everybody. And agriculture is right there available to these youth. But right now it's not attractive. We need to build solutions that make it attractive. In 30 seconds. What is your vision for the future for AGRA? Um, AGRA is in a, a good place. AGRA has built a huge assets base in terms of seeds, fertilizers. It has demonstrated that actually improved seeds, fertilizers, can drive a green revolution like has happened in other countries. Uh, it has demonstrated that building institutions close to farmers can drive a green revolution. So I'm, I'm really uh, uh, very optimistic that AGRA is in a very good position to, to, to pass, to pick lessons from one country to another and be able to very quickly, in a period of probably 10, 15 years, very quickly drive a green revolution because it has, it has the assets base, it has already built that assets base, it has the ability to move around the, co the continent, it has the convening ability, and it has, it's created as an alliance of partners, including IDRC, to bring people together to think and, and build solutions that, that can transform the continent. So I'm seeing that Agra is very well positioned to be able to drive the agriculture agenda very quickly because it's bringing in governments as well and governments are interested and are listening uh, and uh, I think it's a very good partnership. And I can say that Agra is in very good hand under your leadership with the passion that you are bringing as well as the savviness and the knowledge. And you know, IDRC and Agra share a lot in common. Our organization are about knowledge, are about innovation, are about solution. And we help to bring these innovation at a scale that makes a change and you're doing this in spade with mm -hmm. Agra. We're doing it in many other areas. Yeah. We are helping to build leadership. You are one of those leaders in action in Africa that influence the global agenda, and we are doing it in partnership. So with these words, I want to thank you, Agnes, for joining us today on this Leader in Action series. It has been a pleasure to welcome you at IDRC, and you will be welcome anytime you're back in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I,
And I want to thank the audience for listening to us today. At the bottom of the screen, you will see the website of IDRC as well as the website of AGRA addresses appearing. Please do consult those sites. They are full of story of success and as well as challenges when it comes to agriculture development and not only for development purpose, but also for business purpose. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you.